Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural webinar for the Believe Tourism Future series. My name is Angela from Let's Go Believing, and I'll be your host for today's session. Before we get started with the presentation and to allow others to join into the session, I want to mention that the Believe Tourism Futures isn't just another webinar series. It's a transformative space where we aim to redefine the future of tourism. Through monthly webinars packed with thought provoking provoking topics and esteemed guests, we're hoping to enhance your skill, foster sustainability, and ignite creative thinking among industry professionals like yourself. This initiative was inspired by Lorenzo Gonzalez's de dedication to Belize's economic growth and is supported by the Emergent Ventures grant from George Mason University's Mercado Center and in collaboration with Let's Go Believing Limited and the Lodge at Chat Creek. Today, our focus is on an introduction to experiential travel, a topic that promises to unlock new dimensions in the way we approach tourism experiences. To guide us through this exploration, we have two exceptional trainers. First, we have Lorenza Gonzalez, who is an economic development professional dedicated to fostering inclusive growth, and he is the founder and author of Belize Adventure, a top-ranked travel blog that many travelers read and use to plan their trip to meet. Joining Lorenzo is Michael Sonchina, president of Sonchina Travel and Event. Michael's wealth of experience in crafting unforgettable travel experiences promises to offer invaluable insight into the world of experiential travel. Now, with that said, I'd like to cover some housekeeping notes. For those who are in the session right now, there is a chat box available if you'd like to share comments or ask questions. All the questions that are asked during the presentations will be answered at the end of the presentation and during the Q&A session for those who would like to use your camera and mics to ask questions, you can send a request for me to enable those features for you. To do so, you can hover over your mic icon at the bottom of your screen if you are on a laptop or a desktop. If you're on, on mobile, then there is an icon at the top right corner for your mic. You could just tap it and ask for the mic and camera feature. So without further ado, let's dive into the world of experiential travel. And I welcome Lorenzo Gonzalez. Let me start by introducing myself, telling you a little bit about my, me. So I'm born and raised in uh, in in towns of San Ignacio and Santa Elena. Um, I, uh, I've always been, like, you know, for the past like 20 years, I've been involved in tourism. I'm very passionate about this. I, I believe that uh, tourism is very, a very important industry uh, because it, the, the barriers to entry are very low. You know, any, like mostly anyone, they don't need us. You don't need to go to university. You don't need to get a master's degree to be able to get a job in tourism. You don't even need to finish um, you know, standard six. So I think that that in itself makes tourism a really powerful sector to be able to like uplift uh, um, the lesions and, and be able to, to make them, you know, be, participate in the economy and, and get success overall. Um, so because of that, like I, I went into that industry uh, and, and in general economic development to play a small part in, 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 making Belize a, a better, better nation. Uh, yeah. So when I moved to Canada in 2020, 2012, uh, I, um, I, I moved to Toronto and then I, um, I shortly after I went and I did my master's in economic development and, and innovation. And now I work at uh, digital main street where I help Canadian small businesses adopt digital technology so they can compete and grow against larger uh, organizations. And um, the whole reason for this is because I believe that um, if you support local economies and local communities, um, there's a better society overall. And for example, like if I, I'm able to support small little biz businesses that are like in the downtown areas or downtown core, I feel like that is, uh, that makes the community stronger. And yeah, so next I, I will just uh, pass it over to Michael to be able to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Sanchina. I'm currently living in Winnipeg, Canada, which is right in the middle of the country. I'm from Toronto originally, and I've been in tourism for the last 10 years or so. I've been very lucky. I've worked for NGOs in Central 
Asia. I have been a blogger for a long period of time. I also also work for a luxury travel company where we do tours in Europe and in Japan. And I also have my own small company here in Winnipeg where I take people around the city and engage with them in new and unique ways. So I hope to share a little bit of these experiences with you as we continue this lecture. And I want to say thank you to Lorenzo for giving me a chance to talk. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Michael. So yeah, so on today's agenda, um, what will happen, uh, how this presentation is broken down is that I will provide the, what we would call the academic part of this uh, session. And then Michael, with his lived experience, uh, will provide the, what happens actually in practice. Because often um, what happens in academia or what is like the theory of how things work don't necessarily equate to the, to the same things that happen in real life. So we want to make sure that you get a wholesome idea of what this, uh, you know, experiential travel um, uh, topic is about. So uh, we, we were able to divide it this way. Um, so what, first of all, we'll define experiential travel, why it's important. And then I will introduce uh, the experience economy concept. Then Michael is going to come in and chat about challenges and solutions. And then we will do a wrap up on like, what are the key takeaways and things that we want you to um, to make sure that you leave uh, knowing. So yeah, so what is uh, experiential uh, travel? So basically, it's uh, it's more than just going to tourist attractions. It's moving beyond sightseeing um, and actually providing experiences to tourists that they are able to engage uh, and, and 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 foster genuine connections. With, the, with cultures, communities, and environments. And it's not only about providing one experience, like, okay, going to the Mayan site. It's about creating a series of activities within an experience so that it ends up being like a narrative that unfolds. Like, you know, there's like one, two, three, four, five. And then at the end, there's like the climax. And that's the way how you really are able to deliver experiential travel to consumers. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, so it's very important to note that what makes experiential travel unique is that, you know, these experiences are authentic and member, they're memorable activities that unfold over time. So I want that, uh, that, that be something that you always consider that something needs to like unfold and, and, and slowly you, provide the service or provide the experience that, that the traveler needs. Um, and it must connect with the travel. You must connect with the traveler on a physical, emotional, and um, spiritual or, or intellectual or social levels so that they are, you know, that they have a unique and impactful journey. And I provide on the left, you, you see an example of uh, the Shonantanich Mayan site, which is a really uh, incredible um, Maya, Maya site here in, in um, in uh, Tayo, right? And if you would just take a traveler, a tourist to the Mayan site and you know, tell them about the history of the Maya and just like show them around the grounds, that is not an experiential travel experience. That is just sightseeing. That's taking them to see a Mayan site. But an actual experiential travel experience is more along the lines of, okay, when someone signs up for a Mayan site tour, the, you, you include it in that package. It's basically like maybe a half day or even an entire day um, experience where they first you teach them about the ancient Maya and then the present day Maya. You take them to one of the communities of, of present day where present day Mayans live. You make them engage with these locals. You make them, uh, you know, talk to all these, uh, all the, 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 the people. And you, 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 you perhaps even um, give them a, a, a tour of like um, traditional Maya medicine plants. And, and, you know, slowly they're learning more and more and more and being immersed into the whole history of Maya, uh, the past and the present. And of course, um, you can even help them, uh, you know, cook and eat the food, make them you know, try to like, you know, cook uh, like the lunch and then they have it. And it just basically overall, the, the whole um, premise is that 
you have them immerse and 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 they're doing activities and and yeah actually walking them through a narrative and then at the end you show them the mayan mayan site so that they can like go home with that experience where they're like oh wow like there was like a full day um or a full half day of of, of activities that just built on each other and ended up with uh, like uh like having a memorable um, experience overall um I have an example where I, I've heard like uh, one tour guide in San Ignacio and um, what, what he does is that he, he understands Mayan, the Mayan, the ancient Mayan language. So he teaches guests how to do, write their names um, in Maya and then they can take that home as a souvenir. You know, that in itself is providing going the next step, making it more immersive because then the person will, will will forever remember that being like, oh, wow, like I learned something new. And on top of that, I was able to like do it myself and I was engaged and, and it took me a different level other than just like looking at something and then going away. So, uh, but why does it matter? Um, in general, um, I think it's important for you to note that w- there've been so many studies showing uh, the transition towards like the importance of experiences and people wanting to have experiences versus buying stuff. And there are a lot of reasons for this, but one of them is simply that uh, experiences shape your identity. Yeah, things, things that you experience are end up becoming a part of who you are. So if you, like, I till this day can remember that I, when I traveled Central America as a teenager, you know, it was a, a scary, scary experience initially. But when I came back to Belize, I had all these ideas about like what tourism can be and what my life uh, it should be like. And it was simply by one simple backpacking experience in Central America. And it, and it's, it, it wasn't like I remember there's like uh, being like discouraged by people telling me, why would you go? They actually would even make up nicknames for me saying, because um, my, my, my middle name is Lois and and they know me as, so a lot of people know me as Lou. So what they would call me is white boy Lou. So I used to find it like, uh, uh, you know, I used to find it like demeaning or like, not de- demeaning, but I used to like not like it so much because I'd be like, you know, they just call me white boy Lou, white boy Lou, because I used to like doing all these like things that tourists do. But in the end, like now I look back at it, I was like, wow, like, you know, now Everyone's doing this. Like I was just a trendsetter, basically. Um, anyway, this is why I want to sh- share like that. Experiences are like sh- helps shape your identity. So this is why people prefer buying it over stuff because stuff come and goes, and, and but experiences are what make you and actually help you shape the person you are. And um, there's also like another study by Bloomberg right here that, that sh- suggests that like. Almost, this is like almost 90% of millennials travel to immerse themselves. And the reason for this is that uh, we live in a very fast paced life, uh, you know, that's very superficial also. And people are looking for meaning, 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 meaningful and purposeful experiences. They're looking to connect with others. Maybe this isn't the case like in a developing country like Belize, but like in the US or Canada, who is actually your customers. Like, I don't know my neighbor, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know the people that live around me. I live in, I live in an apartment building. So it's a house that has three different units and I barely know, I, I know my upstairs neighbor, but I don't know the one that lives below me. I, I see him once or twice uh, every six months. You know? And this is common for North America. Uh, I don't mean to generalize, but like, especially like in Canada, people don't connect with their neighbors. They don't know their neighbors. You know, you only know your friends, your family. Aside from that, there isn't a sense of community. So we long for that. You know, people want that. So they are um, looking for it when they travel. They want to go and talk to the the, the, to the, the, the taxi driver and hear how the taxi driver um grew up and and I know all these stories that he has to share about like you know his experiences um you know living in a in in a small uh community 
You know, you they want to connect personally. I don't know. Raise your hand if you 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 engaged with a tourist and now you're Facebook friends with them. You know, raise your hand if you have engaged with a tourist and now they're your friends, like real friends, not Facebook friends. I that's happened to me. I, I visit friends in the U.S. all the time that I met when I was a server at at Cajal Pets Resort. So this is what people are seeking. They want to connect with individuals. Also, um, another reason why ex creating memorable experiences is important because um, we know that people are booking classes and workshops more and more as whenever they go to a tourist destination. TripAdvisor actually said that every year over year, the bookings for classes and workshops have been doubling and doubling and doubling. So uh, one of the most popular things that people do when they travel to like Cuba, for example, is book uh, salsa classes. You know, they want to learn how to, how to dance salsa, you know, from a local and be able to engage. And, you know, even better, what's even better than engaging the local, you know, dancing salsa and uh, with, with the teacher, the teacher you know, inviting you to go have dinner at their house and you meet their family. That's a memorable experience. That's something that I have been able to experience. And, and, and it's, it makes me re remember fondly uh, about Cuba, my time in Cuba. And that is, I wish I could go back and, 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 and you know, spend more time and, and hang out with the people that I met then. So as for what are experiences, I think uh, one of the best examples is Disneyland because they are in the experience business. You know, you know, the park is designed to transport customer guests into various and like yeah, themes and uh, and worlds. Like you know, and and people engage with their favorite characters and live out their dreams. You know, and then this is also for for kids and adults. Everyone loves Disney, and because. And and there just be one entrance fee, and it gives you access to many experiences. And a lot of the experiences that you have, let's say you go as uh, with your family to the, to to Disneyland, the experience you have there, uh, you know, with with your your siblings or if you're a parent and your kids, you're going to talk about that around the dinner table for years to come. This is why a lot of people that visit Disneyland are actually like adults on their own. And they're coming, they go back because of nostalgia. They remember their parents taking them, you know, and, 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 and they, they really love that. And then experiences can also be small. You know, you don't need the big infrastructure that, um, that Disneyland has. Millions and millions, maybe even billions of dollars that they spend on, on, on making sure that's magical. It can also be small. And my perfect example for this is the San Ignacio Market. Um, you know, when you get there, you're enthralled by all the sights, the sounds, the smell. You know, it's all your five senses are, are are tingling. You know, you you hear people talking. You see all the different cultures. You smell all the different food. Yeah. And 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 it's all like unfolding through time. You know, to, to the point when you go and you choose the restaurant where you're gonna eat. And then when you choose the restaurant that where you're gonna eat. Then you get people, you, you, you get to meet uh, you know, the lovely people behind it where they're like making the food in front of you and they're engaging with you. And you also sometimes get to see the dynamic between the mom and the son. You know, the son perhaps isn't happy to be there. He wishes that he was like out playing, I don't know, marbles with his friends. So, but... At the same time, he can't not be there because the mom says, yes, you have to be here, son. That's interesting to watch, you know, in general. And then you go and you eat your plate of food. That is an experience that people can't easily have in, in the U.S. or in Canada. So they go, now you know why they go to, when they go to San Ignacio and they go to the, the, the farmer's market, they're like, wow, this is such an in, incredible, interesting experience. It's just because that's a memorable experience. That makes that is one of the benchmarks that you should always consider. Think about making sure 
that the guests experiences the like their whole senses are in, are heightened when they are doing something. And then there's like experiences that can be passive. And this example here is like where you, where I was on this tour and it was just like, I was just listening, but they still made it good because they added various activities to it. So first of all, the tour started, the tour was showcasing how an area where I went to university has changed or and is changing. It's called the Kitchener Waterloo region. You know, it used to be a manufacturing hub, but when manufacturing left for places like China, like there was a massive decline of, 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 of the economy. But then we've seen a shift to the knowledge economy where people um, are coming for university and a lot of people are staying and then the tech companies are coming. And then there's a contrast between the old and the new. So the tour started by us visiting an old butcher shop and a pioneer uh, house founding people of, of one of the, the, the cities, which, which is still owned by descendants. And we were able to hear from them. We were able to like engage with them and, 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 and see what, like, and like see the photos of like what, how things were back in the past. And of course, like when we walk further down to, to, to the downtown, we see like the modern building in contrast towards the, the old, old places, the old manufacturing uh, buildings and this build this uh building that you see here modern building that's actually where google is so google um one of their first headquarters in canada was in in, in kitchener waterloo where, where they move uh, and it's kind of surprising but at the same time you're like it's like this is all this is very interesting and anyway my point is that it, this tour worked even though I wasn't in, that engaged in the storyline. I wasn't like, doing things. It worked because it unfolded through time and it, it made me able to connect with the story because I'm, I'm there um, doing my, I was there doing my master's and I was a part of a community and it made me better understand the community and want to like do participate in the community and uh, yeah, just be a, a part of it. And then there's, active um, um, experiences. And this is a, one of my most memorable experiences that I had. Um, and and it, it's called um, Cook Your Catch. I don't know if anyone from Hopkins is here. This is an incredible experience. And I actually looked online and I, I heard like I little browse through the different um, reviews. And one of the reviews it says is, this was the highlight of an amazing trip to Belize. The amount of activities included in it with this excursion makes it a bargain. You see? So people are thinking, wow, like I did multiple things for one price. Because it's always, so they, they were they're able to make it a package. And that is one of the things that, that, that you need to do, consider whenever you're creating your experiences. One of the reasons why this worked was because of one, um, when they pick us up in Hopkins, first of all, the, the guide, along with his um, co-worker, um, I, I think he, I know the tour guide, his name, till this day, I remember his name, his name is Meds. Right? So he, he was teaching someone else, like how to be a tour guide or like, you know, he had an apprentice. So I like, you know, they, we, we chatted about like one life is like, you know, living in Hopkins, being a tour guide. You know, he told me like some of his like experiences and what well, he enjoys the most about this tour. And then we went and we um, caught bait because we were going to go fishing. You know, and then we, at the same time, while we're catching bait, he tells us about the mangrove forest that is by the, near uh, the place where we were catching. And then after we have the bait, we, we go fishing. You know, and it, What's incredible about this too is that a lot, if you don't want to go fishing, you can also snorkel the patch, the many patch reefs that are around there. So imagine you go snorkel, you see the fishes that are underwater, and then you notice which one you use. Like, okay, you know what? I actually want to go after that red snapper. So you get on the boat and then you go fishing for it. You know, I don't know if you can catch it, but but that's part of the experience. You know, and then after you catch your your, your your fish, 
it's time to go cook it, right? So, but where do you go? How about like a, a nice private island where you can experience what it is, what it is like to like, like, you know, be in a, and be or live in a, in a secluded island. And then while we're there, a meds is preparing the food. You know, in front of us, he's like scaling the fish. And then he gets also, we had, we got, we got conch. So he also opens a conch, a conch and shows us what it looks like and, and, and tells us a little bit about the history. Like, I mean, about like, you know, conch season and how, um, you know, how, how we should make sure that like, like whenever we're eating any things from the sea that it needs to be um, in season because uh, it has negative repercussions if it's not. You know, like sustainable fishing, sustainable tourism. He was talking about all of this. And then he, he allows us to help prepare the food, chop up the vegetables, you know, cut the, cut, cut the fish, you know, help make the ceviche. That in itself, like we are immersed, we are a part of the experience. And then at the end, there's this nice, really delicious plate of, 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 of beans with, with, with barbecue fish, um, <laughs> ceviche, you know, and, and, and flour tortilla. I don't know about you, but this is basically one of my favorite meals I've ever had. And I can't even, I, I don't think I'll ever forget this. But, that, but that's it. That's how you create memorable experiences. You make sure that people go through a series of activities that engage them and they are able to connect with individuals and, and, and there's, a, like, there, there's a transformation in the end. Like you feel that you are a part or you feel connected to these um, tour guides or, or individuals. So is this all new, like the experience economy? Certainly not. Like um, there's been, like the, a lot of people has, have, have done research on this, but they basically have, uh, no, they've come up with a framework sh sharing that actually the, the economy has been moving towards experiences for a long time. This, it's just been amplified by the pandemic, you know, and one of the main persons that has been able to help us conceptualize like, uh, this, this theory, uh, or, or the way how the economy now works is Joseph Pine and, and James Gilmore. And, and they wrote a book back in 1999 um, about it. And basically, what, how it goes is that, okay, so at one point, the economy, and, and we can think about the U.S. So that, let's think about the U.S. economy. It was founded in, in 1776. Another time, 90% of the population worked in, uh, at farms. So commodities are things that you can extract from the ground. You know, you plant and extract from the ground. So the majority of the economy, people would uh, work in agriculture. And you can actually think about your, like your past generations and maybe what did your grand grandfather did? Like, or did your, was your dad able to work in tourism or your great grandfather? No. Tourism is a progression of the economy to services and then experiences. But before I get ahead, after the agricultural economy, there was the industrial economy. So that's when, you know, you people use the commodities to create items, goods. You know, and, and, and for a long time, there was a lot of manufacturing jobs, especially in the U.S. But then with, as, as time progressed and the, you know, manufacturing jobs move elsewhere, then U.S. witnessed uh, a, a shift towards the service economy. So, and, and by the 1950s in the U.S., like the, the U.S. economy employed had more than 50 percent of its, of its population working in in services. And naturally, the the, uh, the next progression after services is now experiences where, like, services aren't enough. Like when you're like if you go to a coffee shop shop to drink a, a coffee and it's just and there isn't a nice, interesting ambience and experience, like you don't, you, 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 you won't be engaged and, and, and enjoy it. For example, my favorite coffee shop here in Toronto, it's 
called Oko Espresso. And the reason I go there is primarily because I really enjoy talking to the business owner. That's part of the experience. If I wanted just to pay for a coffee, I would go to, I would go to like a fast food chain and place like a McDonald's and just grab a coffee. But no, I want to go and be in that ambience. That's part of that. And so that's moving towards the experience economy where you go to a coffee shop and you're, you're engulfed in, in, in the experience and you are become a loyal customer because of that. And to better explain the progression of economic value, I'll give you an example here in, in tourism. Um, and it's like, so in this graph, at the bottom left, like whatever is there, it's less money because it's on less differentiation versus I've, it progresses. I, like there's more, like you can charge more for an item as you differentiate it more. So as you know, commodities such as uh, cacao beans, like they have a set price. You can't, you can't sell it for more than your neighbor is selling it or, or, or the other person, like the other country that is exporting it. It's the same price, right? Because it's a commodity. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't make it a great experience. And then once you take the cacao beans and make it and, and, and use it to create a chocolate bar, then you can charge more for it. You can charge more for a chocolate bar, right? But how can you charge more than the cost of a chocolate bar? You take the commodity and you open a gourmet coffee shop in a chocolate, chocolate shop and then people go in there and they're eating chocolate, their chocolate, gourmet chocolate while they have a coffee or something. Then you can charge more for that. But then what about if you take someone on a cacao tour? That is where the experience comes in. That's where the experience economy comes in, where you can charge, you know, first for a commodity, you could buy, you could just charge. I mean, like for a good, you could just charge like what, let's say $5 for a chocolate bar. But if you provide a tour, an experience for someone to be able to go meet the the, per, the, the farmer, meet, you know, like pull the, 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 the cacao uh, from, from, the, um, from the tree, you know, make their coffee, I mean, make their chocolate. <laughs> you know, this... In itself, you can charge way more. So this is what showcases the, the, the progression of economic value as, 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 they, as it goes up, you can charge more. So in a way, it is, you're providing value for the, for the traveler or the, for the guest that wants to the, the experience, but you're also providing value for the tourism industry for yourself. And finally, there's a transformation part where if you are able to make sure you, you, you connect the dots and you are able to move, make that person, like make the person experiencing the tour guide and the tour, the, the tour. If you're, if you can make them get really immersed and care about the experience and, and connect with everyone, they're able to like go back home and recommend the tour, but also be someone that next time they go to a store and they see a chocolate bar from Belize, they're going to purchase that because they remember that experience and they remember that they want to support that farmer. They want to support that industry. Okay, so um, next we'll, uh, we'll have um, Michael covering some of the challenges um, based on his lived experience. So what I, I talked about is just theory and now he comes in to share um, what it's actually like in practice. Okay, is everybody still awake? Can I see some kind of movement to see if there's a reaction around? Okay. It's okay if you're asleep, just don't tell me. So, uh, thank you, Lorenzo, or White Boy Lou, as they were saying, for that introduction. Uh, that was very uh, helpful to understanding the, the academics behind this. But... What's important to remember is that academics in real life, though they are very similar, they're not always exact. You can always try to put the um, grids and things over each other, but they don't always follow through perfectly. And 
especially nowadays when you're talking about the experience economy in the world, uh, the hardest thing that we are dealing with is trying to make things authentic and trying to make them exclusive. So people don't want the same experience that everybody else can have or else why are they going to leave their house? You know, somebody from Toronto who's going to go to Belize wants that fishing experience, wants to see the food prepared in front of them, wants to have that communal experience because they're not going to have it at home. And generally that experience will be for the small amount of people that are with them. So this has to be translated through lots of different experiences. One of the strangest, not strangest, one of the biggest examples I have is uh, I work in Japan and people really want to meet sumo wrestlers. And sumo wrestlers are very uh, important celebrities in the country. People don't really have access to them in day-to-day -day life. But the only sumo wrestlers who are allowed to talk to tourists are retired ones. But they're not. They're not active anymore. They're not playing in the sport anymore. But uh, people sometimes don't understand how lucky they are to be meeting these sumo wrestlers. All they do is focus on the fact that they're not participating in the sport anymore. And somehow they feel like it doesn't match up with the image that they have. So when you are coming together or putting together an experience, you have to make sure that whatever image people have in their mind follows with the experience that they're having. And it has to be for... Uh, a value or for amounts that they will be happy about. And this has gotten harder and harder after COVID because people saved some money over COVID, lost some money over COVID. And now the experience that they're expecting is very big because they feel like if they take your tour or go with your experience, they are basically giving that money to you. So you have to find a way to make whatever they're experiencing Whenever that service is, whatever that experience is, and however that transformation happened, very good, or they're going to feel like the experience wasn't worth it. And this is the hardest thing to do right now. Uh, Lorenzo, can you go to the next slide, please? So some of the best ways you can do this is you have to look at your environment. So I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, working in a luxury tourist market, which I do with Calc because A, I'm their employee and I don't want to give away too much of what they do, but also those customers have a very high price point and their expectations are a little bit different than what you would see from day-to-day -day tourists. When I am doing something in Winnipeg, it is very important for me to figure out a way to make whatever these people are experiencing uh, special to the place and like real. So as long as you can balance giving people a real experience for a price that they think is fair, then they will have that experience. They will enjoy it and they will transform and either take the skill or the experience back and tell other people about it. Uh, go to the next slide and I can get a little bit better. So uh, in a place like Winnipeg, because you may not always be in Belize when you're working, our greatest resource is its history. And Winnipeg has one of the best preserved downtown core with 1920s history and people come from all over the world to, to see these buildings but not everybody wants a passive experience they want uh extra things to be put into it and it's always hard to find a way to link history with with experience so uh many of the guests who come with me on on a walking tour we will you know, talk about the history of the building, talk about the history of Winnipeg, but there has to be something matched up with it to enhance the experience. So often what I'll do is I'll take them to a distillery where they make rum and they make gin and they make whiskey because Winnipeg has a, a big tradition of making alcohol and they go in and they see where the alcohol is made. They try alcohol using products from this part of Canada. So that way they can see the history of, of the liquor being produced while uh, understanding why it's historically important to the place that we're going to. And if you don't have this tangible thing, if they can't touch, touch something, taste something, see something while they're engaging with something passive, I feel like they don't have as much of a experience as they used to. So people maybe before COVID were very happy just to go and see a building or see a historic site or see a statue and hear the history of it. Now they want a little bit more. They want uh, that experience to be elevated and they want something tangible to go with it. 
So if you can offer them something to see, taste, or touch while you're doing these tours, you're making it that much better. So if you're planning something, or if you're working for a hotel, or if you're working on a tour, always remember it, it's not just the, the site that people are interested in. They, they want it to be elevated in some way. They want it to be uh, memorable from the sensory perception. Can I have the next slide, please, Lorenzo? So <laughs> I know it's a funny picture of me with a lady on it, but what I do in Winnipeg, because I know people don't want to engage just with history, but they want to engage with um, with local businesses and they want to engage with local performers and they want to engage with a bigger part of the city is that uh, not only do I do walking tours and food tours and things like this, but I create event nights where maybe the, the experience will last four hours. And in those four hours, we will visit a historic building. They will try multiple restaurants that have things to do with uh, Winnipeg culture and society. And then I invite some kind of show person. In this case, it's a burlesque dancer. If you don't know what burlesque is, it's uh, kind of like a strip tease. You know, everybody likes a dancer and most people like beautiful women. So it's a good mix for men and women because this is a combination that people enjoy. And because they're getting the history, because they're getting food and drink, because they're getting education and because they're getting a show, people feel overly that it is worth their time and worth their money. And they can it worth their money is very important because people don't want to do something that they can do on their own. And they don't want to feel like they're paying more to do something that they can do on their own. So you have to come up with ways to make the experience bigger than what they're doing on their own. And if you can facilitate that, then people will be happy. They need to leave the experience knowing that they couldn't have done it on their own and that they got something local or unique to the place that you're at. So in my case, it would be going to one of the oldest hotels in the city. Then it would be having food from one of the top restaurants using local products from Manitoba or Winnipeg. Is. And then it's a show that they couldn't organize on their own. If they can do all these things, then they are very happy. And that's what makes the experience worth it for them. The, the objective is not to be, it's okay to be passive. If people want that, then that's what they signed up for. But I feel like people post-COVID want the extra thing if you can include it and make it worth their price point. So I was told that we were supposed to keep this uh, um, in about an hour. So I tried to go through this a little bit quickly so that we can have 10 minutes or so for questions. So why don't I go over to Lorenzo? If he wants to bring some questions out, we can do it. And then uh, we can continue to the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, Michael. Yeah, just to wrap up, um, I'll go over some of the uh, key takeaways and then we will have a, a brief uh, Q&A. So uh, first of all, I think there's anything that you um you can go away from this presentation and I, I like I want you to like remember is that there's been a shift towards experiences instead of just material things. And I know this is like perhaps like more prominent in developing I mean developed countries because stuff is cheap and easily accessible. Um but but that is the case. Like if I want something, there's Amazon overnight shipping. I just choose it. Go, I go to Amazon.com, um, choose what I want, and the next morning someone comes and delivers it for me. So all these things are cheap, easily accessible. And then there's also the issue with social media. So because of social media, um, we are able to see all the things that our friends are doing, and then we also want to do them. And then we also want to do things so that we can show them. So this has made it more valuable to like actually do things than to have things you know and also and another thing would be that we have again going back to the pandemic pandemic reminded us about the beauty of having experiences with others you know the the, the, the creating memories with your family you know creating memories with your friends or even strangers you know like how, how like i remember for my mom's birthday during the pandemic before they had found the vaccine I, um, I went and I saw my mom from the front gate and she was like upstairs, like, you know, and I just like, I said like, happy birthday, mom. And, you know, and I felt so sad that I couldn't go and, and hug her. 
I was concerned because my mom, you know, it's, it's like, like I, I had heard that, okay, you know, like this might be more tricky. Like COVID was more tricky with, with older, older people. So I was like, oh, you know, I don't want to like expose her to, to, to me. Uh, but anyway, my point is that, that like, you know, like that made, that reminded me what is important. Like the pandemic reminded me that experience is spending time with loved one. That is what's great. And also, I think um, we, it, the pandemic made us reevaluate what um, what is important to us. Like, is working all the time important for us? No. Hey, like, or what about clear preferences for brands that support personal growth and contribute to, to the world positively? That definitely is something that pandemic made me reevaluate. So, and, and two, um, so the progression from experiences to transformational experiences. So just like a regular experience versus something that transform people. And I think the reason that this has happened is because, again, we, we're in a very, like a fast paced uh, world that is superficial. So we want to have more purpose and meaning. And I think one example of this would be that oh. people are, a lot of people are concerned about like global challenges, like. Um, and climate change, and they're concerned about cultural preservation. So they, so when they travel, they want to make sure that they, they that their, their their impact on on their destination isn't one that 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 they will regret. And 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 an example for this, I have like when my when my girlfriend traveled to Kenya and she went to the markets and she saw um at the markets at the at the rural markets she saw a bunch of Secondhand clothing to the point that there were reams and piles and piles that people couldn't even get rid of it, and that's because North Americans, like we, just go through clothing uh, like over like we don't we just like every every season we change our clothes, but where does all all that clothes end up? It ends up in the landfills. So by by my girlfriend seeing that experience, like she's seeing all those secondhand clothing everywhere. And that the people can't even use it, and how it's been, in, in, you know, messing up local industries. Like when she got home, she was transformed to the point that she's like, "Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna be a minimalist. I'm only gonna buy a few things from brands that I respect." And of course, what she does has passed on to me, and now I am a very conscious consumer of of of, of clothing of things. And number three, um, we need to understand that. Experiential travel creates value for tourists and the tourism industry. So for tourists, it creates the value by providing them with meaning and memories and helping them achieve their aspirations, what they want, like, you know, who they want to become, things they want to, you know, how the personal growth they want to achieve. And the value for the tourism sector is that it, it's, it, it results in economic and environmental benefits. And finally, four, I, I think it's, uh, I want to impress on you that you need to always invest in knowing your audience to create great experiences. They need to be thoughtful and you need to know what you're, what are you trying to achieve? How are you helping your audience achieve these aspirations? And it's also an opportunity to further develop your tourism product because the more niche you can go, the better. I, and maybe you've heard this before, but like, it's like there's an old adage that says, when you market to everyone, you're marketing to no one. Anyway, so that's um, my last point, and I, I know we're a bit short of time, so maybe we can just jump quick Q and A. But before we have any questions, um, I just want to mention that our next presentation will be next. Uh, it will be in March twentieth, uh, and it will be on how to create memorable, meaningful, and memorable experiences. So, if you want that recipe to be able to apply that to your to your tourism products and and just, I mean, products in general or experiences. Um, make sure you tune in. All right, great. I hope everyone enjoyed the the presentation. I honestly, when Lorenzo talked about the experience with the cookie catch, I remember that one because I also had an experience with them doing the um, bioluminescent tour. Um, where we traveled on this, I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the city river, we traveled down to head to the, 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 
And then the guide was just like telling us about all the animals in the area and the history about the river. And so as we go along to head to the actual location, um, I was already immersed with the guide within my surroundings. And by the time that I got to the lagoon, it was just like a magical experience. Because before you get to the lagoon, there were like a bunch of mangroves and the plants were all there. And by the way, it's dark. So you just have like your flashlight and you could only see with your flashlight pointing around. So that entire experience was just like so magical for me. And I could remember it up to this day. Like I remember the guide. I remember the people that I was with. I remember the surroundings, the lagoon, everything. So definitely creating memorable experiences is a plus. And once you could get that recipe done, then I think that would be pretty, really beneficial to like your business and to get customers to like book with you and go through that same experience with you as well. So I definitely um, do think that, you know, memorable experiences are very important and what Michael and Marissa shared could be very valuable to your business if you are a cooperator in your industry. So, yes, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it down um, in the chat and then we could just discuss them. I guess in the meantime, while you guys um, sort of type up the questions, maybe by cooler though, yeah, we could answer this one that I have for you. Um, how could we convince our operators that are making these experiences um, make it more memorable? And how is, how is it the investment? Michael, you want to take that um, just from your experience or do you prefer if I? Uh, she cut out when I was listening to her. So why don't you answer okay. and then I can add something if you, if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. So, so the question is, um, I believe, how can we convince like uh, tour operators that making experiences more memorable is a good investment? So like, that would be like, if you're a tour guide and you know, your boss is like, um, the one in charge of what actually gets sold, like, you know, like what, what the, the end product. Well, I've, it's the very simple way is like, you can do the research and, and, and show them the research that, that suggests the move towards memorable experiences and how people value it. But even another thing to consider is like Belize primarily receives word of mouth, um, adver advertising, does um, word of mouth advertising. The majority of tourists I speak to, and, and when I run surveys, because I have my own uh, travel website, when I run, I, I run a year long survey. Every month I would, I would, I would survey several people and, and I would ask them like, oh, how did you hear about Belize? And about 70 to 80% of the time, they said through friends and family. So that's because you made the experience memorable and great. They had a great time in Belize. So they were able to go and brag about it, tell their friends, tell their family, because you won't recommend something if you don't believe in it. Right. And, uh, and for example, like you can also provide analogies. And, and, and one experience is, um, for me, it's like when I was a server at Calpage, I, my manager would tell me, oh, no, don't, I want you only to recommend or, 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 um, restaurant. When tourists ask you where to eat, tell them, you know, that they should eat here because the food's best here. And, you know, like at the time I would I, I never said this, I can now because I'm no longer employed there, but I would not pay attention to that, you know? I'd say, no, 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 like I can play my part in making sure that the tourists, they have a great time in, in, in Tayo and in San Ignacio. I was like, so what I personally did, I went and I did the research, ate all the top restaurants in San Ignacio. And then when tourists would ask me where to eat, I'd be like, okay, you bought a package. So the food here is already a, a provided. But if you want an incredible experience, you should go to Hannah's, you know, and you should get this meal. And then you should go to Urban's and you should get, you know, their, their, their rice and beans with beef and, and, and then, or you should go to some other place, you know, like, um, Sinaitis, a Belizean food, like, and, and, you know, like I, I, in the end would receive so much tips for doing that. And so it's like, in a way I was like helping myself out, but I was helping the business, the, the, the tourists, but you know, and I wouldn't like tell everyone how much money I was making, but the tourists were so happy and so, so, so content with me that they would just be like, Lorenzo, we have all this cash left over from all this U.S. cash left over. Here you go. Like, 
And then I'll look at it and be like, did you just give me 400 US? And this is like 15 years ago. And this will happen so often. You know, and of course I didn't like, I, I didn't broadcast this and tell everyone, but people, I was in the, I, will, I understood the experience economy already and I wanted to, and I said, I will play my part because I will make, the value will be for the tourists and I will get the, I, I, I made enough money to buy myself a car. Yeah, do you want to add anything, uh, Michael? Yeah, I mean, it, it's important to get some kind of feedback, especially if you're, you're talking about it as being like an individual, learning about Belize, using your experience to enhance the, the guest experience. But if you need to convince somebody that this is what's important for their business, yeah, you're doing the research is great, but you need to be able to, to communicate it to your boss. So like surveys are perfect. If they can see nine times that they enjoyed the most, the going fishing and cooking, and it wasn't just seeing the temple that made them happy, you have that proof to, to change somebody's mind. So if anybody is in the position where they need to change somebody's mind and prove to them this is a better thing, than like a survey or showing people in the comments over and over again that this is what's being repeated and they'll prove to that individual that that experience is what the business should be going for. I mean, I don't think there's many, I mean, unless you are going to like a, a very high-end hotel where people want to like have branded items or something, you're right. Everybody wants the experience of wherever they're going. They're going to remember what they learned or what they felt over what they bought. So you need to have that experience and be able to teach somebody that. All right, great. Uh, this isn't a question. It was a comment from um, Mr. Froiland. He mentioned that um, since 2019, the tour guide training program um, now has an additional component, which is the professional core and tour guides are now being trained to offer memorable experiences and to offer more small talk to tourists. So I think that plays a role in the experience that travelers have, which is great. Yeah, no, I didn't know this, and that's really great news. I, I'm happy to hear this. Um, yeah, so make sure I, I. One thing I would add to to this is like when you're doing small talk, small talk with tourists, you should like be conscious of the things you're seeing, or whether it conflicts with the values of the tourists. Okay, so for example, there are certain topics, you know, religion this religion, sex, and what uh, politics that you shouldn't be touching. Yeah. I know you might be very passionate about that, but <laughs> that's not you know, good etiquette to, to talk about that stuff. Okay? Um, you should be conscious about that. Um, I don't know if you want to say something else about that, uh, Michael. Well, I would also try to stay away from politics unless you're going to uh, an art gallery where like the art piece has to do with a specific perspective. But the world is getting more and more um, open to to different ideas and different politics, and we know more things going on, but you never really know what that person you are touring around thinks or feels. And even though you may feel that a lot of people have the same opinion as you, you may, in the end, accidentally offend them, especially talking about sex. Don't talk about sex. But get you in trouble. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other question from the chat? I mean, everyone has been saying great presentation, so I must commend both um, you, Lorenzo, and Michael for the wonderful presentation. Um, it is 2.11, and we've been in the session for about a little over an hour. So if we don't have anything else to add, then I think maybe it could be every time to end the first session. I feel like it went well other than the beginning, but um, I hope that everyone enjoyed the presentation, found it useful, and hopefully could take some golden nuggets back and reevaluate your experiences or your services that you're offering at your Google. And we, I guess we will see you next month in the next lesson. It would be on March 20th. So if you haven't registered for it, you could still do so. And I guess um, that would be it on our end. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Yeah. Um, also, thank you to the Mokita Center and it's called the Evening and the Lada Chakrit for supporting this initiative. And we will see you next month.